Well, welcome to Implementation Science in Action. Uh, my name is Simon Pipkin. I'm with the Capacity Building Center for States. Um, it's my honor to be here today to not only open this session, but to introduce our star-studded panel. And we are missing one panelist, so uh, hopefully he'll join us here shortly. Um, I will say that a lot of work has gone into to bringing this session to light. Just a little behind the scenes, I was part of a work group to get this session started. And in this large work group, I uh, thought, I better say something. So I said, hey, how about we do an implementation science that's a little different where we bring in some national experts to give their perspective on frameworks and how they maybe uh, tailored those to meet the needs of their clientele and their, and their communities. And I left it at that, and then it, here we are. So that's great. And uh, I must admit, when I came in here early to see the setup and saw our names up here, the first thing that popped in my mind was that old children's activity. One of these things is not like the other. One of these things does not belong. And that would, that's not a gender <laughs> quote, but that's more of a, this guy is just the moderator. Um, so what I want to do is introduce our panelists, and I'm not going to read their full bios to you. You guys have those in there, but I'll just give you their, their name and, and where they're coming from, and they'll tell a little bit more about themselves as they come up to speak. First, we have Anita Barbie, and she is a professor and distinguished university scholar at the Kent School of Social Work at the University of Louisville. And then we have Brian Bumbarger, who is the assistant director for knowledge, translation, and dissemination with the Prevention Research Center at Pennsylvania State University. And then Patrick Canary, who is out in the hall somewhere. <laughs> Say hi to Patrick, everyone. Um, if I can find my notes. Is he's the senior research associate at the Begun Center for Violence Prevention Research and Education at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel School of Applied Social Sciences at Case Western Reserve University. So if you join me in welcoming our, our panelists as they get ready to come to speak. Good morning. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Good morning. All right, it's good to see you. All right, let's wake up. Okay. <laughs> um, yesterday there was a panel on implementation, and I think that there's a theme throughout our conference here of implementation, so hopefully we're not going to repeat too many concepts that you've been hearing over the last few days. The work that uh, I've done in this area uh, began in the late 1990s. In Kentucky, uh, we uh, developed um, a casework practice model in 1996 and began to install it and implement it. Uh, and I was part of a team that helped to work with the supervisors to make sure they were understanding the model so that they could work with their, their folks. We had a Children's Bureau grant to do that and we did a lot of research to, to show that the model had an impact on practice and outcomes for children and youth. In fact, the work that we did uh, not only focused on training the people to understand the work, but also was in, in, in embedded in the IT system and the policies and our CQI tool, and we were able to publish some pieces in the last few years to show the impact of uh, practicing with fidelity on outcomes. And if, if people would just follow these kind of practices that you're all installing, you could probably reach your CFSR outcomes, and that's our hope. Um, <laughs> Uh, that model was then installed in a number of other states, Washington, New Hampshire, New York City, private child care agencies, Australia, and they're now doing it in Georgia. So um, I've seen that and done some evaluation work there. The other piece that, that, I, that I come to this with is as a, a part of the evaluation team for the cross-site evaluation of all the um, Children's Bureau T and TA network providers. Over the last 10 years, we've been looking at that process of helping states, jurisdictions, tribes, and courts be able to do the work um, and, and make, things, make things happen in an appropriate fashion. Uh, and of course, now we're looking at the capacity building centers. And then finally, locally, I've done some work with organizations uh, to embed some evidence-based practices with youth, and I'll talk a little bit about that towards the end. Um, okay, so that's, that's why I'm here. And those are some frameworks that we're going to talk about. Now, why is this important and why is Title IV-E, this, this demonstration waiver, so important? Even though child welfare has changed tremendously over the last 15 to 20 years, and we've seen reductions in the number of children out of home care, and we're reducing recidivism, and we're, we're making some impact on, on children and families' lives, we still aren't there yet. 
There's still cross-generational child maltreatment happening. We haven't broken that cycle. We still have disproportionality. Uh, we still aren't reaching our CFSR outcomes. And our workforce is struggling. We still haven't made sure everyone has a social work degree and has the right credentials to be able to do very complex work. And the millennials are making this even more difficult, which we can talk about another day. Um, <laughs> they don't want to put up with this stuff, <laughs> so they're leaving in droves. <laughs> um, so we've got to change the way we, we do things, and I think um, doing innovation and making sure it's done well and making sure they're gaining tools and, and skills is actually the way to keep them. So uh, just keep that in the back of your mind. So we have a lot of work to do, and this is happening in the, in the midst of uh, a very much changing funding environment. So the Title IV waivers, I believe, partly were not only to see innovative ways to reach outcomes, but they were also designed to change the way we fund child welfare work and, and agencies. And I think eventually the Congress will look at this program and say, do we need to fund uh, this work differently? And there's not a, a good taste in people's mouth about funding any kind of government, especially with regards to social services. Um, it doesn't matter which side of the aisle you're on, there's just a less uh, commitment to that. Um, and so I think we're going to be changing how we do the work, uh, how it's funded. There's other programs coming up like Pay for Success and, and uh, Social Impact Bonds, which are bringing in the, the for-profit sector to fund innovation uh, as long as the, there's some chance that it will work, um, and then paying getting paid back by the government for those kind of innovations. So the days of just doing work because you think it's good or because you like it or because it's a trend or because some other state's doing it is coming to an end. And the great thing is you all are in the middle of, a, of an experiment to really look at what works and make sure it happens. And, and implementation science is key to that. There's a lot of uh, critical factors that will increase the chance of you reaching those outcomes and being able to prove to your legislators, prove to the, the Congress, uh, and prove to the private sector that this is worth funding. So there's some models that I'm just going to kind of share with you briefly uh, that might help you in that quest. One, uh, and these are from Abe Wandersman, it's not my own work, but I, I love his work and, and so I, I use it in my own. Um, and I was actually a part of the group that helped to create this first interactive systems framework. Uh, he was working with the CDC at the time on prevention work with the um, violence prevention group and coming up with how do we bring science and our knowledge of what uh, how human behavior and how change happens at the, at the individual and system level, how do we bring that in to build capacity in individuals and organizations so that they can then deliver those best practices, those innovations, uh, evidence-based practice in a way that uh, will reach those outcomes. And so there's general capacity and, and innovation capacity. And general capacity uh, is all the things that kind of support your ability to do the innovation, like the leadership, the uh, organizational culture and climate. Um, being open to learning and changing and growing along the way, not being punitive to your workforce when they try new things, acceptance of, of evidence and being ready f for that change, um, and also those, those structural things like policy, SACWIS, et cetera. So you can't do an innovation in a, in a system that's broken and that doesn't have those kind of general capacity pieces. And so a lot of the work that's done when we did the work with um, installing practice models, which is a huge you know, shift to a, a whole system, there was no way these things were going to make a difference if we didn't have the supports in place. People aren't going to follow a new practice if the policy doesn't back it up, because otherwise you're hanging in the wind when something bad happens. Uh, you don't want to double the work and have one form to fill out in paper and then have something different on the SACWA system. If caseloads are too high, you can't focus, uh, et cetera. So we know those things are important. And there's you know, evidence and ways to improve all of them. I'm going to go back to organizational culture and climate for a moment. Glisten and his team down in Tennessee have developed uh, an instrument that measures organizational culture and climate. Culture is you know, basically the expectations and norms for, for how you do your behavior, you, know, you do your work, and climate is how you feel about the work uh, as a result of um, you know, the psychological well-being that occurs. And you know, there's six factors that influence this and that can lead to a positive uh, outcome of culture and climate or a negative one. 
proficiency, having people who are, who are ready with the knowledge and the values to engage clients properly, not being resistant to change but being open to it, being engaged uh, with those folks that you're working with, um, being supported, having low stress, and being in an environment that's less rigid. And there's the latest study of this was done in 2014, and I think that people need to begin to use that work and use that team to help them uh, to change those cultures and climates. Because what I see in state after state is that when the culture goes bad, and it can, and it can happen rapidly <laughs> um, uh, with changes in leadership and things, it's very difficult to do the kind of work that you're wanting to do. And so if we don't have that kind of accountability of measuring culture and climate and then looking to see and hold people accountable for it, we're not gonna be able to work, do the work that we want. So that's one of the lessons to take away. The other model that um, Abe came up with is this getting to outcomes model. And what I like about it is that it's very simple and it helps folks just think, what are the key steps that we need to systematically go through to make sure that when we're implementing something, it's done with integrity uh, so that we can reach those outcomes. And it's been uh, utilized, again, they, he's a community psychologist who came out of the prevention world, works a lot with public health in areas like drug prevention, um, you know, teen prevention, pregnancy, homelessness, et cetera, although there's been some work at home visiting with this. And, and what they do is they teach these organizations how to implement in a way that's um, very systematic using these steps that I'll describe. And there's been research, six studies, three of them are randomized controlled trials, Two, three of them are um, quasi-experimental designs to show that when agencies use these implementation steps uh, as they're doing an innovation, they get the outcomes, and those that don't, don't. And it's a significant difference. There's evidence right there. There's evidence-based practice. Uh, <laughs> even our processes can be evidence-based. So the steps are not anything that's rocket science. You think, my goodness, someone got publications and is famous because of this. It's so basic. But people don't do it. This is what's amazing. <laughs> it seems simple, and you think, sure, we're doing that. And when you get down to it, people really don't as much as, you, as they think they do. So you have to be honest. Are you really identifying the needs and the resources to do this new innovation? Are you really setting goals that are clear, that are reachable? Are you really looking for the best evidence out there, and not just the most popular or what the consultant that you know knows how to do uh, with no evidence behind it? Are you really seeing if it fits? and making sure you've got those organizational and innovation capacities in place to be able to install it. Uh, and are you then evaluating in multiple ways? Now the nice thing about this group is you all have very sophisticated evaluations built into your, your projects, so you're doing this, and so you're going to be able to add to the, to the evidence soon. Now the other piece of this is this evidence-based system for innovation support. Uh, and it's tools training, TA, and uh, a feedback loop, some QI, CQA. And that's what really helps to then support the implementation of these kinds of projects. And on your table, you'll see some charts um, that we did with another study, but it, I'm gonna show how it's applicable to the kind of work you're doing. Now this is, this is my deep dive into, into something kind of specific if I can find my sheet. It's right there, could you hand me that? I'm almost done, just one, thanks. Okay, so when we were doing um, our teen pregnancy prevention program in Louisville, Kentucky, we, we engaged 1,450 high-risk youth in the poorest neighborhoods in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, about 300 of them were foster youth, about a, a little over 100 were uh, refugees. Um, and they were all very, very poor and very much in need of relationship education and, and uh, sexuality education. <clears throat> so we were testing, it was a three-arm RCT, two different um, implementation um, innovations, reducing the risk, which is just your basic comprehensive sex ed. They get right in there and start practicing how to refuse sex and get out of it and say, I have a headache, <laughs> which would come in handy later. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and then there's a, we tested that against an, a new program called Love Notes where they learned about healthy relationship skills and violence prevention. And in that context of, of that and life, uh, life skill uh, and life goal orientation, how do we go on the success sequence and, and have children a little bit later after we've found a decent person that we can stand for the next 18 years to help raise these children? 
Um, so that was a love nose. And then to a, uh, a counterfactual, which was how to, how to empower your neighborhood. So um, this was a, a complicated study in 23 organizations with 30 facilitators done across two Saturdays uh, about every month. We had about 40 times that we did this uh, intervention. We followed the kids for up to two years. Um, and I was you know, freaked out that we weren't going to find anything if we didn't have tight control <laughs> over how those, those facilitators implemented that evidence-based curriculum. And so we, we used this model to make sure that at every step as we were piloting it and as we were running it and as, in the follow-up, that we made sure that they had impeccable training, that they had the tools that they needed to deliver the curriculum with uh, fidelity and that we emphasized the fidelity and we had people observe them every time they gave it to make sure that they stayed on track. Um, and we gave them the, uh, other tools to rate themselves and their partner. Uh, as well as the children rated them and, and the observer. So there was a CQI component. We fed that back to them as they did the training. Every week they got some feedback on how they were doing. Then we gave them technical assistance to tweak how they were engaging the youth, how they were sticking to or not to the curriculum. And we did that throughout, uh, this, uh, throughout the project. And don't tell anybody, but we were only two of the 16 that had their data that had significant results. Two out of 16. Oops. And I think it's because we use good implementation science. We had great people who were from the neighborhood and who cared and really engaged and loved youth, but holding people accountable. So how does this apply in child welfare? If you're learning a new practice, you don't just send them to training and say, good luck, hope it sticks. You've got to give them the tools that they need in their SACO system, in their workplace, to be able to enact it and follow it. You've got to do the CQI uh, and feedback how they're doing in their practice, which we have all these you know, case reviews, but is it tied to the practice that we're teaching? You've got to embed that into your CQI tool and make sure that the supervisor and coaches around them are giving them continual coaching, uh, case consultation, and reinforcement of what they learned so that they, they get the fidelity. You've got to get fidelity. Um, otherwise, you don't get the outcomes. In all of our research, we found that only when people did the practice with fidelity did we get the outcomes. I know you think, really? Y'all get paid for this? But it's true. Uh, but it takes determination and focus. Uh, and, and in our child welfare systems, it, it tends to be so chaotic that we, that we tend to let these things go. But I think if we use this kind of discipline in our work around practice, uh, we'd find that some other things would maybe fall away and the stress would go down and we'd begin to see these positive outcomes. And I see New York sitting here and, and uh, uh, Graham Wyndham is one of their agencies that uh, uses solution-based casework and they just came out with some numbers that are unreal. I mean, they cut recidivism uh, in half and they, you know, placed the kids fast, you know, twice as fast as they were doing previously. and. Um, you know, they're getting the outcomes and they're supporting the work in that larger city system. So we know it works and that's what keeps you all going is knowing that this will really help. So lessons, use data. Data is really important. Data at every level in assessing needs and seeing if the fidelity is there and, and coaching and mentoring. Um, making sure you actually build, have that readiness and look at your culture. Make sure you're really, really, really doing the supports that are needed for the practices that you're trying to embed. And don't kid yourself, planning's not enough. You've got to actually follow through with that coaching. If I had you know, a video and more time, I'd show you uh, what Dale Curry always shows us in training uh, sessions, which is the scene from Dirty Dancing where, where <laughs> Patrick Swayze shirtless. <laughs> it, yeah, there's a reason why I, I, I teach human sexuality. Uh, <laughs> so uh, teaches, you know, her how to dance. And it's not just, you know, a, a little instruction and good luck. He's, you know, looking at her, her head and her arm position and holding her back and her stomach in and looking at all the things and coaching her constantly. And that's what it takes to get this level of change in your workforce to get the outcomes that you want. So um, make sure that you, that you do all that. Uh, now, those of you who have been doing this for 18 years and you think, my God, woman, I know this. I've been doing this for 18 years. We've had a lot of success. <laughs> Illinois, other states, you're thinking, I, what, what's, this, what's in this for me? 
Here's your challenge. Can you make this so embedded in the agency that with, with numerous changes or when you leave and retire and go sit on a beach somewhere, it's still going to happen? That's the thing that keeps me up at night. <laughs> uh, and so y you want to be able to use these, these systems and, um, and teach the next generation how to do it so that they can keep it going uh, into the future and, and make a difference in the lives of, of children and families. Thank you. All right, thank you, Anita, not only for that great presentation, but for that image of Patrick Swayze. <laughs> and now I can't get the song out of my head. <laughs> so um, next we'll be having Patrick Canary come up. Um, again, I'll remind folks that just came in a little later, um, please review their bios. They're in the packets. And also at the end of the presentations, I failed to mention, we will have a Q&A session for each of the presenters. Patrick. Good morning. I had one of those SAT dreams as I walked in the door and saw everybody seated and the panel here and Anita speaking. I was using yesterday's agenda. Um, so my apologies, plus it's being caught on tape. I don't know. I mean, it's not a good way to start. So this may be the new reality show, Bad Presenters. Um, um, so my, my apologies. Anybody here from Ohio? Oh, so I'm busted totally in my own state, so, okay. So uh, what I want to talk about a little bit, I think, is, is going from the 30,000-foot view to the 20,000-foot view um, about implementation and selection of evidence-based practices. And again, I know that as an audience, you're quite experienced and gifted um, in talking about evidence-based practices, and that's terrific news. So partly the presentation I think I'm going to share might be tools helpful for those that you work with that are actually doing the implementation of a practice. Um, so while I'm going to talk a little bit about systems issues, I'm also going to talk about some of the issues related to embedding practices into an organization, as Anita was referring to, and some of the challenges that we see literally at the ground floor. Um, so two seconds just on uh, the background of my organization. We're at Case Western Reserve University. We're a center of excellence for the state of Ohio. And our focus literally is helping provider organizations, regardless of who they are, select and install and sustain evidence-based practices, particularly for multi-need, multi-system kids. So that's really our focus. Kids whose intersection is child welfare, juvenile justice, behavioral health primarily. So, you know, part of um, that whole process is, you know, the identification. And, you know, as Anita was saying, it, it feels like it's not rocket science, and yet I have this paper that just came out this month with seven PhD authors on the implementation <laughs> basis of evidence-based practices. So there is some deep and heavy science to this. Um, my background is really at the policy and program level, so I'm not a practitioner, I'm not a researcher, I'm not a clinician. Um, the role that I play is helping to be maybe that honest broker with our organizations that are implementing evidence-based practices. So first of all, we need to talk about, you know, what's the impact area? You know, what tools are people using to even vet evidence-based practices? When I entered this field, I'm of a certain age, that this was totally new stuff. The idea of talking about implementation wasn't even on the radar screen. It was find a program, hire people to do it, go. And in six months, we hope you're going to get some good outcomes because your grant depends on it. Um, we've come a long, long way from that. Um, part of the other question is what, what level of evidence are, are you looking for? I mean, that's part of, not, not always part of the discussion. You know, a lot of times we talk about the gold standard. The RCT standard, that is not the only standard of evidence. So part of the decision-making process is what level of evidence are we even talking about? And perhaps the most important question is really the feasibility question. How feasible is it really to do this? It may be a fabulous practice. It may have gotten great outcomes in Tennessee. It may have gotten great outcomes in Michigan. But I live in Cleveland. So tell me, is it feasible for me to do that here? And how much of that do I have to think about? So when we talk about feasibility, I mean, I think it's the bottom line question. Can, can we really do this? 
Can we adopt the program with fidelity? So these are all pre-loaded questions. These are pre-selection questions. Is there room for adaptability based on local circumstances? So as we begin to vet the programs, can we do them as they're designed or do we immediately out of the box, are we talking about tweaking them? I would get, offer you that that's a red flag. Um, if the first question is, I really like it, but could we have the caseload at 15 instead of 10? You're probably going down a path that's gonna um, be problematic. Is there compatibility of the potential provider with the unique characteristics of the practice? So do you have the provider profile? You might live in a community where you have a provider. I live in a community where there's 20. So that's a different strategic question in terms of um, implementation. Cultural relevance, consumer salience, and essentially does the program fit in our local system of care? And I think this is what, where it begins to get lifted out of the discussion of just a clinical practice, and how does that clinical practice fit into your overall system? Because it is your system that's gonna probably make or break it. So I, you know, I referenced kind of the level um, of evidence that you're seeking. So this is just a chart that, um, that we've used uh, when we talk about um, levels of evidence. I'm sorry, I'm on the wrong slide. Um, so all the way from no evidence to expert consensus to replication in real world settings. And that's a continuum, and it's a valid continuum in which to have a discussion of your stakeholders um, into, you know, into what um, focus you're gonna take and how important um, that uh, level of evidence is in the credibility um, and in the attitude of your stakeholders and providers. Um, so obviously there are some basic questions. You know, what are we actually trying to address? I mean, what, you know, let's get it down to, the, you know, somebody talked about it today, this morning, the, you know, the elevator speech. What is it that we're trying to change? Why is it a compelling area? And who is it compelling to? I mean, part of that begins to pull into the notion of who's gonna be your stakeholders, who are gonna be your champions. If this is a very, very specific issue that may not impact beyond maybe a very, very narrow area, not that that isn't worth doing and might very well be worth doing, um, but think then about the engagement of others in that. Um, so, when, you know, so one of the things we talk about is are there common outcomes across systems that people can focus on? So what are the driving factors and the evidence that you have locally to support that? Who are your stakeholders? What other approaches have been tried? What results did you get or not? Um, and what lessons did you learn? Um, and I think that that issue of lessons learned is really important. I think that sometimes we're, we're not always so willing to talk about the things that crashed and burned. Um, or we may be willing to talk about them, but we may not be willing to unpack them to figure out why they crashed and burned. You know, how many times have you heard, yeah, well, we tried that program here, it just didn't fly. Well, why? Maybe we ought to, you know, take a backward trip in time and look at some of the factors. Was it an implementation issue? Was it a workforce issue? Um, was it a commitment issue? Um, so, you know, we need to be cautious about the folklore as well, about that'll never work here. Uh, particularly if it's something that keeps showing up on your potential list of things that you want to um, look at. So, in our work with folks at the direct care level um, and at the systems leadership level, we really look at three kind of key areas. The fiscal implications, the clinical implications, and the systems implications. And again, I think a lot of these are you know, self-explanatory, but I think they're important questions to review with whomever it is that you're engaging. Is this startup versus reinvestment? Meaning, is it a one-time grant or is it something where you're taking dollars and really redirecting them and so you know that you're gonna have some dollars moving forward? Or is this something that you know you have for two years, but you have no idea whether three years and four years is in the future? So I think that's an important you know, fiscal question. Talking about what's not reimbursable or uh, inclusive in the practice model that you're looking at. Um, do you have a formula for sustainability, particularly if it's grant focused? Are multi-system partners contributing to this, or is this a unisystem um, endeavor? In that case, supporting something on one pillar can be very uh, risky, particularly when we're talking about multi-need kids, 
and multi-need systems, which again is the, you know, the lens at which I kind of push a lot of this through. And what are the realistic opportunities for reinvestment? Are there really opportunities um, to show the cost benefit? And I know that that term is kind of loaded and we can interpret it in different ways. But can we part of the advocacy base it on the realistic potential for, for reinvestment? So some of the selection factors then on the clinical level have to do with the available, available expertise. I mean, the example I just gave, I live in a very urban, suburban, rural state. We have areas where we have a plethora of providers, experienced providers. We have areas of the state, huge geographic areas of the state with one, two providers. And they may be providing a whole array of services to both children and adults. So that's an important factor. Workforce development, key. Ongoing coaching and training, we certainly know that now from experience that you can't install it and walk away. The, um, what's Karen Blasi from NERN call it, the, uh, the spray and pray model. You know, you go in and spray the countryside with your training and then you pray that some of it will stick and people will carry it forward. We know that doesn't work. We know it's simply not with these interventions, it certainly doesn't. Um, the rigorous quality assurance that Anita talked about, the data collection, and the outcomes focus. And all of that has to be real. I heard John Lyons this morning saying, you know, if the data doesn't mean anything, if it isn't used, it's not useful. And so we can't ask people to do those things if there isn't a train back to the station about how this makes a difference, whether it's from a clinical level or a financial level or a political level. And Simon, you're gonna tell me when I have five, right? Okay. And at the policy level, uh, and this is where we do a lot of work, where I do a lot of work with our local uh, stakeholders and champions. Ohio is a very local control state. Very little happens on a top-down basis. Um, and even the stuff that does happen on a top-down top down basis has its own flavor at the local level, as you all know. So is there an infrastructure to support implementation? And I know in Brian's remarks he's going to begin to talk about how do you build something that takes it from a single community to a larger uh, geographic area. Is there multi-system alignment? Is there a shared population of focus? I mean, more and more when we hear child welfare, there's almost always a slash to juvenile justice. And it feels that that's still the journey that we're on in terms of how to really implement um, and engage those systems in a way that um, we get the outcomes for the kids and families. Are there shared outcomes? I mean, I think to me, that's one of the real power messages. Um, can I demonstrate that the use of this intervention, and the goal may be family re reunification, but the outcome ripples from that. And, and while we as a child welfare authority may be primarily concerned with that outcome about reunification, our systems partners are happy to know that there's a very positive bounce from that reunification for their systems and for engagement of those kids in, in their systems. Um, and then the public sharing of outcomes. I think it's real important. I think the dashboard we saw this morning, I thought was fabulous. Was that Wisconsin? Um, amazing, amazing to be able to show people literally where your need is, what, how you're responding to it, what the performance is. I mean, all of our public systems are going through dashboards now. Hospitals have been doing it for a long time. You know. I live in Cleveland, there are now two big hospitals. I can go and look at what their outcomes are. So, you know, that, that technology is with us now too. So I think I'm probably gonna be wrapping up here um, in a minute. So I think, you know, I didn't invent this. I think my good friends at the National Implementation Research Network talk about, you know, what's the equation you need in order to get things done? Need, support, resources, readiness. That's gonna tell you that this is maybe a good match or not. And I think it's okay to have the outcome to say, we started here and realized, mm, who knew all of these things were a part of this? Who knew all of these issues and challenges were gonna be a part of the discussion? And maybe it's time to kind of back up. There is one study you might wanna look at, it's called the IDARP study, and I'm not gonna go through it, but when our centers of excellence were created in Ohio nearly 15 years ago, there was a study to study whether using centers of excellence as a way to promote practices was an effective vehicle. Um, the news is good that there is evidence to support that. And those are some of the characteristics, again, not rocket science. 
that says, you know, what happens. One thing that maybe isn't on there that I have informally heard, so I guess I can't put it in the evidence category, and that is personal relationship factor. Who knows who? Who has a relationship with who? And while that can be a real benefit, it also has a downside because, as we know, people leave, people change. And, you know, Anita, I think your comment about being worried about kind of the next generation um, is exactly where it comes. But there is a huge part of our work that relies on good faith, um, honest brokering, um, access, that I think we don't always talk about. So um, I think we've, you know, we've talked about um, challenges, insufficient upfront planning, funding is driving the process rather than a need, um, limited number of champions, um, lack, in, lack of buy-in from your stakeholders, um, a limited long-term view. I mean, if people look at this as something to check off on the list as the next thing, um, you may wanna think about that. The over-promise over of the intervention. Make sure that you really do your homework about what the expected outcomes are. And this is where I think you dial in your friends who have done this in other states and other places and talk about the experience. Resistance to change, limited risk taking, that the selection is not guided by what it's gonna take to implement it. So selection and implementation, while they're different silos, eventually they converge um, and need to. And all implementation is local. I kind of think about it like vineyards. You know, you can kind of take the same grape and vine and plant it in one place and you can literally plant it a mile away and you're gonna get a different taste and a different flavor um, that comes out of that when it eventually becomes wine. It's the same thing at the local level. Installing a program or working for a program at a specific place, it'll inform you a lot, but it won't be the bottom line and that's where you need to do um, your homework. And, where the ho and the good news is the tools are transferable. The technology is transferable. The climate and the landscape, I think, is what changes. Um, and then we've talked a little bit about you know, adoption to adaptation. And again, my friends at NERN say they're at the bottom. First adopt, then adapt. You really have to get it down as to what it is the protocol is. Then you have the conversations about is it possible to tweak this and still maintain fidelity and still get the outcomes that you need. Um, and I think that's, that's really key. And again, you know, simple diagram. This is what our reality <laughs> looks like, you know. Um, you know, it just is, you know, it just is. So realistic expectations, proactive management, troubleshoot, learn from others. You have to really have a high tolerance for adjustment um, and correction. And you really need a stable inner system platform because this is really what's gonna carry the day, so. I'll let you look at those summary comments. I think we've addressed them all. Um, thanks, and I look forward to your, um, to your questions, and now I can breathe a little easier that uh, this has happened. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick. Now we'll invite Brian Bumbarger to come up to, for the final presentation. Thank you. How's everybody doing this morning? Wow. This stuff's tough. <laughs> you must all be really depressed. <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna shift the lens a little bit um, to to thinking about these same issues, but at a level of scale. Um, and when I when I talk about scale over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm specifically talking about state level scale. So how do we uh, how do we um, move from a demonstration project to something that uh, we've learned some lessons here, now it's time to take this on the road, um, take, take the best of what we've learned and, and scale it up uh, at a state level. Um, but before I, uh, before I get into that, I need to do a quick uh, 30 minute, or 30, 30 minute, 30, 30 second exercise. Uh, this is an activity, I'm sorry, I know you don't wanna, Get out of your seats, but I promise if you're compliant, this will only take about 30 seconds. So I need everybody to stand up, right? At, stay at your seat, just stand up, face the back of the room. There's a camera on, so I'll know if you're following the rules, even though you're not looking at me. Okay, I need you to close your eyes and raise your, raise your right hand if you work in the child welfare system directly. Keep your hands up. Now, if you've been working in that system for more than three years, 
Also raise your left hand. Okay, thanks. You can, you can open your eyes and turn around and sit down. I got my picture. <laughs> that literally has nothing to do with my presentation. But see, here's the thing. I've been doing this, I've been in this line of work for a long time, and I've always struggled to explain to my daughter what I do for a living. So when she was in elementary school, I told her that I was a national hokey pokey instructor, and I just went around, just went around the country teaching people to do the hokey pokey. So now I have photographic evidence. Even though she's 21 now, I think she's still buying my story. So, so first a little background on, on why I might have something to say about, uh, about implementation science. I've, I've been a researcher at, at the Prevention Research Center at Penn State University uh, since 1998 and specifically studying dissemination and implementation of, of evidence-based programs, including the, the barriers and the facilitator to, to scaling up evidence-based interventions. Um, uh, since 2008, I've been, uh, I've, I've been running a, uh, a state-level intermediary organization that tries to do this across multiple systems. So I've been, in this, I've been in this game of trying to scale up EBPs for quite a while, and uh, I, I, I feel that makes me an expert in a specific way. I'm an expert like the first monkey shot into space. <laughs> I've learned all the things to do wrong because I was just making it up as I went along. There w I didn't have any really peers, I, fought, I thought for a long time. I didn't have any people to steal ideas from that I, that I knew about anyway. So I was just making it up as I went along and then I would just take really meticulous notes about the mistakes that I made. So I'm here to impart all that wisdom so you don't make the same mistakes. I want to, uh, so again, just clarifying the goal that this is the the Forey Waiver Demonstration Project. Waiver meaning we had to waive the rules to get beyond the traditional structure to do some innovation. And demonstration project, meaning we had to do it in a few places to, you know, to try to innovate and see what, what bubbled up. But now we need to move from waiver and demonstration because we've been doing this for a long time. A lot of you have been at this for 10 or 15 or even 18 years. So we need to be thinking um, more and more each year, and we've already been thinking about this, but we need to think more and more about how to move from demonstration project to scale. Uh, I'm gonna talk about Pennsylvania's uh, evidence-based programs initiative as an exemplar, and this was created outside of the child welfare system. This was primarily a system that was created to serve the juvenile justice system, but as we'll, uh, as we'll discuss in a little bit, the reality is, I hate to break anyone's heart, despite what your mama told you, you're not the special snowflake. Um, all of these systems are having the same problems. Every system that impacts children and families is struggling with these same exact questions. How do we get the things that have been proven to work into systems, into practice, at a large scale, done well, sustained, document their outcomes, monitor their implementation quality in a, in a feedback loop that, that promotes continuous quality improvement. All the systems are struggling with this same thing. So, I, so even though I don't work directly in the child wel welfare system primarily, um, I think that uh, what I'm gonna talk about has, uh, has some generalizability. So many practitioners uh, see these evidence-based programs that we're trying to scale up as, as Rube Goldberg machines. You know what Rube Goldberg machines are? Everybody see the, the play, remember the game Mousetrap? Right, so Rube Goldberg, Goldberg machines are these unnecessarily complicated uh, machines that are created to perform a simple task. And this is, this is sort of the way a lot of people view these, uh, these EBPs. They're unnecessarily complicated. They have too many moving parts. They're just, they're just hard to do, and, and that also makes them expensive, and it makes them hard to do right. So this is why uh, we, we have, we've come to this place uh, where we have to have so much emphasis on fidelity and implementation. Evidence-based programs represent innovation, but the reality is that innovation without sufficient capacity is of limited value. I don't know if you can see that. The cows are sitting on the couch, the phone is ringing, and the cow says, well, there it goes again, and we just sit here without opposable thumbs. 
So it doesn't matter if somebody's invented the telephone if you don't have opposable thumbs, right? So we've got all these great, we've got all these great interventions that have proven effectiveness, but the, let's, be, let's, let's face reality here. We all work in systems that have existed l far longer than any of these evidence-based interventions, and far longer, in fact, than the evidence-based it base itself. And the systems that we work in look pretty much like they looked before we had an evidence-based and evidence-based interventions. So we're, you know, we're, a lot of what we're trying to do here is pound square pegs through round holes. So that takes some capacity building. It takes some intentional system reinvention. That's what we need to do. It's more than just getting up and pointing your finger at providers and saying, pay closer attention, do better work. Be, you know, be, be more concerned about fidelity. It takes more than that. We really, it's a really heavy lift. Uh, and if, if this litany of things that we keep putting up on our, on our PowerPoint slides about, all, about how important implementation quality and fidelity is and how hard it is to do, if, if, all, if all that creates a, a really uh, significant challenge at the provider, at the individual provider level, Multiply that times every provider in your state and think about how challenging it is, especially if what, if what we're doing is asking people to do it on their own, figure it out as they go, be a lone wolf. We're not creating any synergy across systems. So it's an inefficient system. So this is why we have to get to scale. So the question is, how do we get our knowledge about what works to change, uh, to change the field so significantly that effective strategies become the norm rather than the exception? Think about the cell phone, the smartphone, versus the electric car. Both of those were incredible technological innovations. There's a cell phone in every one of your pockets or, or purses right now, right? There are hardly any electric cars out there. Some innovations just don't go to scale if they don't have the capacity to take them to scale. So Pennsylvania's, uh, we call it, we euphemistically call it the Blueprints Initiative because it grew out of the, the menu of EBPs called the Blueprints for Violence Prevention. It started with, an, uh, importantly, it started with, a, with a, 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 an earlier initiative that was really about creating community capacity to do really sophisticated community level diagnostic needs assessment. So we built a system to help communities do a data-driven diagnosis of the risk factors at the community level that were driving, in this case, delinquency and youth drug use and school failure mostly. So we had to start from there. We had to build this, this, need, this diagnostic need identification capacity. As, as both of the previous speakers have mentioned, the, you know, the, 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 the science of carefully identifying your need at a pretty sophisticated level is the foundation for everything that follows. And most of the problems with implementation quality and implementation fidelity and sustainability can be traced back to insufficiently informed decisions about program selection, right? So how many people have in your state, how, raise your hand if you have universal statewide use of the, the CANS or the FAST or some other um, validated um, need screening instrument. Okay. And raise your hand if you've had that in place in your state universally for more than eight years. Okay. Hardly anyone. So that means that a lot of states don't even have a universal need diagnostic tool in place. And those who do, again, it's fairly new, which means that the network of service providers and the services they provide has existed longer than the ability to identify needs. That's important because that means that the tools in your toolbox don't necessarily match up to the needs of the children that you're serving, right? So that's one way we have to realign the system. Uh, the menu of these programs in Pennsylvania that we've been scaling up it's sort of a you know, usual cast of characters of evidence-based delinquency prevention, um, but some of these also are programs that you're probably familiar with, functional family therapy, multi-systemic therapy, maybe the strengthening family program, because you know, we're, we're addressing underlying risk factors that, that not, not only predispose kids to delinquency and youth drug use, but they also predispose kids and families to, to uh, child welfare-related outcomes. 
So this is where we started in 1998 or 1999. This looks like a demonstration project, right? This is how many of these EBPs off that menu we had in place in 1999. This is how many we have in 2015. That's no longer a demonstration project. That's almost saturation. It's almost to the point where this is kind of like a block grant or a formula grant program, right? And this is what we need to do. This is, I don't know if anybody has actually come out and said that, uh, at this meeting or previous meetings of the of the 4E waiver project, but that that's what we need to do. We need to move this from a limited demonstration project into into the regular way we do business in formula and block grant programs. So the one lesson we've learned in this process of going from this map to this map is this important lesson: beware of too much push and not enough pull. The mistake that we made, being the monk, first monkeys shot into space, the mistake that we made in Pennsylvania is we thought in the beginning that our mission was to get these programs off from these lists into as many communities as possible. Dissemination for the sake of dissemination, it was a dogmatic approach to disseminating EBPs. Need be damned, right? And so we, I'll admit, we, 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 Spent, the state spent a lot of money getting individual communities and providers and systems to adopt evidence-based programs. They spent a lot of money training people, and then the, the program fizzled because it didn't match a need in the community. And so, you know, it's like walking into a pharmacy and saying, well, everything in this pharmacy has been approved by the FDA, so I should just start taking things because these are all good for me, right? It makes that much sense. So. Too much push and not enough pull. What we need to do, instead of, instead of working so hard to drive out menus of evidence-based programs, we should be building the capacity of providers and systems to know when those evidence-based programs are the best bet. I'll skip that. Um, the second lesson we learned is that, uh, I love this, this quote from Patrick McCarthy of the Andy Casey Foundation, the road to scale runs through public systems. Decades of experience tell us that a bad system will trump a good program every time, right? S and again, this goes, and not to say that our systems are bad, but they weren't, built for the, they weren't built for the mission that we're trying to undertake right now, right? So we need, to, we need some system realignment to, to make them optimized to, to do these programs well. We also began with uh, Wandersman's Interactive Systems Framework, so I'm glad Anita kicked that off for me. Um, we didn't know that we were doing it at the time. We kind of backed into it. We, we did this thing for a while, and then we said, what, what is this thing we're doing? And then we read about Wandersman's Interactive Systems Framework. We said, yeah, that's what we're doing. That happens all the time with DBPs, right? Um, the one thing we rec well, two, two things we recognized when we, when we thought about Wandersman's uh, framework. One was this piece in the middle called supporting the work, prevention support system. That made sense to us, but we'd never actually seen it. It was like Bigfoot. You know, we read about it, but I don't know that we ever actually saw it in the wild. So, so we created it. That became the epicenter. We realized that that's the gap. That's the gap that needs to be filled. We need a support system at the state level that really helps lift all this work up and also helps connect across the system. So there's an intermediary function that's, that's performed by that ISF as well. So in Pennsylvania, we, the, the, this takes the form of a multi-agency steering committee that oversees all this work. And again, this is important because we don't want to create system silos where everybody's trying to approach this common universal problem in their own way. Because who pays the price for that? Who pays the price if every system comes up with their own ideas about how to scale up evidence-based programs with high quality implementation. I'll tell you who pays the price. The poor people on the ground in the trenches who are working every day who have to serve all these different masters who have different ideas about how to do this. So we recognize that. So we created this multi-agency steering committee that brings together all of the child and, and youth, child and family serving systems to oversee this initiative. Uh, through an intermediary state-level prevention support system to, to move science to practice. And the, the sort of three buckets of work that we do uh, include supporting these community prevention coalitions to di di diagnose their need, support to the uh, 
adoption, implementation, and delivery and sustainability of the evidence-based programs themselves, and also addressing, recognizing and acknowledging and addressing the fact that we, th that evidence-based programs are not going to be all we can do. There's not an evidence-based program for every need, and we need, and they'll own, you know, in our best case scenario, the evidence-based programs that are identified on these menus and registries are only ever gonna represent a small slice of the pie about what is being delivered in communities. That's the reality. So we can't ignore everything else. First of all, because we don't know everything else doesn't work. We just know that it hasn't yet been rigorously evaluated and proven to work. That may mean that, it's, that it does work, we just haven't evaluated it. Um, and we can't ever evaluate everything that's going on out there. So we have this third piece that's about building continuous quality improvement into the services that are out there already that aren't evidence-based, but we don't have any specific reason to think that they should be decommissioned. So uh, this is our sort of reinterpretation of Wandersman's interactive systems framework because I'll take you back to that in a, for a second. So if you see, this is, his, this is his model. And one of the things we noticed is all the really important stuff, if we're talking about state level scale, all the really important stuff is just kind of floating around the outside, the funding and the climate and the research and the policy. And we thought, well, that's kind of the really important stuff. So we, uh, we, we, we reworked the model and, and added this extra layer of policymakers and funding agencies as a specific target of our work. So we're working with the state agencies also to try to help work with them to co-create their own capacity to better reinvent these systems. Uh, and this is just a picture of our web page to encourage you to go there. To, because really there's more, much more detail than I can go into today about what all we do, but I, I do encourage you to go there. Um, so what does capacity look like in summary? So we need to build, at, again, at a state level, and it's much, it's much more efficient to do this at a state level than to ask every provider to try to figure this out on their own just by telling them to do it. So we need to build infrastructure to support thorough diagnostic needs assessment. Lots of work being done in that area already, right? So, but, but recognize, I'm not sure that everybody recognizes and it doesn't get talked about too much, that this movement to try to develop universal uh, screening instruments that is fundamental, it's not just about an, a creating an accountability system or whatever, or you know, managing contracts. It's, it's fundamental to determining what services we need to, to address the needs of children and families. We need infrastructure to support thoughtful, data-informed program selection, so more than just give people a list and say, these are the things that are evidence-based, use your money on these things. It's, it's more than that, it's much more sophisticated. We spend more effort than that, you know, trying to figure out what washer and dryer to buy, let's be honest. Inf infrastructure to support training, startup, and optimization of programs and systems. Going back to the Rube Goldberg thing, these programs were, most of them were not optimized for scale up. They're still big and clunky and clumsy and, and we don't know what all the the, the absolutely core element moving parts are, so we can't give really great um, advice about which things you can adapt and which you shouldn't. Um, so this whole feedback loop of trying to actually optimize the programs while they're being you know, uh, implemented out there in real world conditions, that's, that's really helpful to the whole field. If we could find a way to you know, streamline functional family therapy to do it, you know, better and cheaper and, and quicker and more efficiently, whatever. We, you know, we, we can do that as a, as a field together. Infrastructure to support ongoing implementation monitoring and in a continuous quality improvement feedback cycle. So the one thing that I, I'm, I'm simultaneously excited and frightened by all the movement towards data dashboards. I'm, I'm excited that people are paying attention to actually building dashboard systems to, to m monitor you know, all of this data that's so important. Um, but I'm a little frightened because when we look at the dashboards, I mean, there's just a million, er, everybody's developing a dashboard. There's a million boutique dashboards out there. Um, and 
uh, when we look at the most of these dashboards, what we see is an absence of any uh, grounding in specific theory about adult behavior change. And so what that, uh, what that leads to is data dashboards that were created with the best of intentions, but what they actually end up causing is people to game the system. They, they produce, they, they encourage defensive uses of data rather than productive uses of data. Because they're, you know, just because of the way they're framed and because the, some, some core elements that would promote productive uses of the data in a CQI feedback loop are missing. For example, if any, how many people have a Fitbit or, or, an, or an app on your phone that helps you monitor your, your diet and exercise, right? If you have one of those, one of the common elements of those is you get to tell it in the beginning what your goals are. That's called autonomous goal setting, and it produces an engagement and a desire to meet those goals, as opposed to somebody else, as opposed to you pull up the Fitbit and it says, hey, you know, you need to lose two pounds this week. It doesn't work that way, right? You're going to feel bad every time you weigh yourself or whatever, and then you just put the Fitbit away and stop using it. So the, that's just one example, but this is the kind of thing we need to think more deeply about, about how to produce, how to build infrastructure that really encourages people not only to collect data on, on the implementation quality and fidelity of the services that are being delivered, but actually take the time to use that data in productive ways for continuous quality improvement. Wow, I thought I was 10 minutes over. <laughs> um, and finally, infrastructure to support ongoing documentation of impact and return on investment. So one of the things that we uh, developed in Pennsylvania is, uh, um, is a, a, a web-based data platform that collects uh, data on every, uh, every young person who goes through multisystemic therapy or functional family therapy in Pennsylvania, whether that person is in the juvenile justice system or the child welfare system. We track their outcomes. We know what the calculated return on investment number is for both of those programs because it's been calculated and well documented by the folks at the Washington State Institute for Public Policy. So, f so we, we apply that number, that return on investment number, to every kid who has a successful discharge from multisystemic therapy or functional family therapy in Pennsylvania. And on a quarterly basis, we report that data to the Crime Commission, to the Department of Human Services, to the Governor's Office, to the General Assembly, if they're interested. Um, and we can actually say, this is how many, this quarter, in the past three months in Pennsylvania, this is how many kids went through multisystemic therapy or functional family therapy. This is what system they came from. This is what system they were referred into those programs by. We also document whether or not their referral to either of those programs was uh, an alternative to congregate care. So we, we, that, that gets documented on our system because that, that means that if they, if they were referred, in, in, instead of congregate care, they were referred to uh, multisystemic therapy in the community and they have a successful discharge, that means we can also add to the cost savings the amount of money that we would have otherwise spent putting them in residential placement. Right? So we're not just documenting the outcomes, we're documenting what the dollar value of that is. And that's really important for sustainability and for, as, as Patrick mentioned about, you know, this idea of whether the money is actually, you know, whether we can realistically, you know, reinvest and shift resources. That's important documentation to, to give the, the state the political will to think about shifting uh, resources more upstream um, because we, we're no different than anybody else. We have the different pockets problem. So in closing, and Anita said this also, but she said it in a cooler way with a Kentucky, is Kentucky, right? Yeah, we have a Georgia accent. Okay, with a Georgia accent. I think Anita said, don't just, don't just train them and send them on their way. <laughs> Was that? That was awesome, and I love it. I love it. Love it.
Bill Nye also told us this. Bill Nye said it's not magic, it's science. Remember that. So we have to think at a deeper level. And I mean, I, I, mean, I say that jokingly, but there's some level of truth to this because, again, go back to what I said earlier. Our systems have existed longer than the evidence base. That means the systems that we work in have been working on faith for a long time. That's sort of like magic, right? So our systems were optimized to work on faith. And now we've introduced this science and this evidence. And so we need to begin thinking much more deeply about the details and the mechanics and the level of sophistication of our system and our, and our, our relationships between state government and provider organizations and the, what we can do to help build support at the state level to make everybody's job easier in moving into this new era of enlightenment. This is just to prove that I also publish papers that nobody reads. <laughs> Thank you. All right. yeah. Thank you, Brian. Well, I'm sure it's true for all of you. I, there was a lot that was said today that really resonated. You know, I'm not an implementation SME, but I've had been fortunate enough to work on some initial implementation projects in many jurisdictions with the model that Anita mentioned. So I've had a lot of trauma echoes while I've been up here for uh, <laughs> listening to a lot of this but you know and I do have a lot of questions but I want to this is our time to open it up to you guys for questions we have mic runners as you are aware or if not that we are recording this so if you raise your hand please be patient so one of our folks can get the microphone to you because your question is important and we want to record that question so we'll now open it for questions All right, well, I'll start with one of my. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Um, I had questions about the GTO. Um, I'm assuming that GTO is not a linear process, and I wanted you to speak a little bit to that. And secondly, um, if the train is already taken off, how do you then incorporate uh, or help the systems or the programs now go back and kind of look at the GTO process and begin to utilize it. Is this on? Okay. Um, yeah, it looks like it steps in a, in a linear model. Um, that's just to make it easier just to, to think about. Um, you'll notice in this picture, it's a, yeah, that's the circle one. <laughs> it is a circle, <coughs> um, and so, for example, when we were doing our teen pregnancy project, we wrote the grant, we had some input from folks, so we looked at what's the need in our community, which implementation models might work for this population, with some input from folks, and then we, when we got the grant, we did focus groups with youth to make sure, so we went back to need, reiterated that these programs were probably going to be okay um, and so it was iterative in that sense so you can do that with any any um, issue that way and certainly as you're doing the work and you find for example that you think you've trained folks and coached them and it's been a while since they've done the the work because you, you know if you don't practice it immediately um, then we had to go back to do some more training or some re refreshers uh, to make sure that they can do it. So yes, it, it, it's just that these steps are, are pieces of this puzzle and you gotta make sure that you hit them at least once, <laughs> if not multiple times. Does that make sense? And then what was your other question about going back in time? <laughs> I was just saying if, um, if the train has already left the station, how do you then help the program or system yeah. um, really figure out where they are maybe in the GTO process or where they need to be um, if the train already left mm -hmm. the station? Mm -hmm. um, one way to do it is to just to pull those stakeholders together. It, 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 usually this comes up when people are experiencing problems or things aren't working or people are pushing back against the, the work that you're trying to do is just maybe start from the beginning and say, what did we think the need was and do we need to rethink it and do we need to tweak this? 
um, and go through the steps in that sense to kind of help yourself think about where might we have gone wrong <laughs> or what do we need to change now. Um, now, in this, the study we, we just did with the teen pregnancy, because it was a study, we had to keep the train going. We couldn't change anything once it left the station. And that's why piloting is so important. That's why demonstrations are important because you don't scale up until you've really tested it and make sure it works a few different places. Then you scale up. So it's just like in, in, in science. You do a pilot before you actually run the study. And, and it's really not good uh, practice to, to do it too fast. So that's another just little lesson. Yeah. And we, in Pennsylvania, we, 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 uh, we aren't using the, the GT, well, in the work that I do, we aren't using the GTO model specifically, but we're using a very similar kind of circular um, plan, do, act um, yeah. process. And what we do is um, we, have, we have regular uh, technical assistance calls from our uh, Center of Excellence Technical <coughs> Assistance organization to, to, to sites that are implementing this model. And we've developed um, uh, specific milestones and benchmarks for each stage and so the, the, be, the beginning of every technical assistance call is just a quick check to go through every stage, even if they've been through that stage one a long time ago, ev is everything still in order there? Has something changed? Has something fallen apart where we might have to go back to stage one and do a little uh, repair work, a little retraining or refresher, or has somebody with an important job changed and then we need to you know, bring them up to speed? So it's. It's this, it, it, it really is, a, it's, it's not even circular, it's just iterative back to every, and constantly checking on those milestones and benchmarks, literally every six weeks, just to you know, keep up with it, because it's absolutely not linear. Things change. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so I, I first off wanted to say thank you so much for emphasizing a lot of the points you made, especially the adaptation, after adaptation point. I think that's brilliant. Um, so my question for you all, actually, is, uh, or whoever would like to comment, um, <laughs> is when you're implementing something and moving towards scale, so just to provide context, in Wisconsin we're doing a post reunification support program in 35 of 71 counties, and it's a county administered state and we're trying to embed motivational interviewing as an engagement strategy because all the caseworkers and supervisors tell us that substance abuse is the main cause of reentry. So as we're rolling this out, and I'm, I'm the coordinator of this program, uh, one of the dilemmas I've had is do I focus more on leadership, county directors, managers, and then maybe supervisors, or am I gonna get better traction with a blended approach addressing the workforce directly? case managers and the people actually doing ongoing work. And where would you advise striking a balance between those two, both in terms of rolling out an MI program and then also in terms of a statewide initiative or what will eventually become a statewide initiative for post-reunification post support? Great question. I have an answer, but you, you're the scale-up gal, so you can Okay, so, <laughs> so, uh, so I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a student of Everett Rogers' theory of diffusion of innovation. So uh, there was a slide that I had up there that I, that I blew through and didn't say anything about, but it was a, it was a social network map that, where we actually mapped the influence of all of the juvenile court judges in Pennsylvania. We have 67 counties, we have a county-based juvenile justice system, and uh, uh, we often have this, this question of, you know, what, we've got some innovation, we need to roll this out, what's the best way? Because being a, you know, knowing the, the, the sort of diffusion of innovation school uh, of thought, I know that there are lots of, there's a variety of different models, of different approaches. So um, one of the things, and <coughs> typically what we would do is we would, you know, we would, tr in the past, we would have just gone to every county and tried to convince the, the, the you know, the, the juvenile court judge of whatever in innovation we, were, we wanted them to adopt. Um, but then we, we actually did a social network analysis and asked them, we asked the judges and the chief juvenile probation officers, and you can make the, you know, the corollary in the child welfare system. We asked them who, who influences the decisions they make about adopting innovations and about system change and whatever. 
Um, and then we, we mapped that and we found out that there was, uh, there was one person in the whole state that everybody looked to. And that was a, that, I mean, that was just a paradigm shift for us because it, it's a way more efficient if we can just convince this one person <laughs> and, then, and then put him in charge of going around and telling everybody they should be doing this. Because he's obviously got it figured out. And he, and he know, and, and you know what, that was, that's a little too superficial of a way to say it, but the truth is what he has figured out is that he's been working so long in this system that A, he is supremely respected. So whatever he says is much more valuable to the stakeholders, whether it's at the sort of administration level or the line staff level. Um, but he also, more importantly, he's been at it so long that he knows the answer to your question and he knows that the answer to your question is different in different counties in Pennsylvania. So he knows that in some counties, he really, he, it's, it's not gonna go anywhere if he doesn't get you know, three specific um, supervisory probation officers to buy into this, and then they'll sort of send it up and send it down. And in another county, it's very different, and he knows there in that place that you know, if he gets the chief on board, that's all it's gonna take. And then in another county, he knows that it might be, what he might need to do is a more slow, methodical process of going in and engaging all the line staff and literally engaging them in a sort of a long dis, uh, you know, discussion, problem solving, brainstorming, co-creation, where they actually arrive at the decision themselves rather than him going in and saying, I have the solution. He goes in and says, here's the problem. Let's work together to figure out what's the best way to do that. Is that, is that helpful? I mean, I, the bottom, it's a long way of saying yeah. it depends on the context. Yeah. Yeah. There's you know, not one, I don't think there's one answer. And with a thing like motivational interviewing where it's very interpersonal between the um, frontline worker and the, the client, in some of these more complicated things you're trying to teach, you, you often have to have all the layers get it. But something, that it's, a, it's a skill that if they can capture that, it's gonna really help their engagement and, and get that feedback. So in that kind of a intervention, you might be able to go straight to the worker. Um, you don't wanna ever bypass a supervisor because you live and die on your team and if your supervisor says this is crazy, then you're out. Um, so you, you bring them along, we often train them together. Um, but it, it depends on the intervention too, not mm -hmm. just the context. So in that one, I would say that, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, I, I don't have any, I don't think I have anything original or different from that, but just to emphasize one, you know, as I said earlier, all implementation is local. That's a real challenge if you've got 67 counties or 88 counties like we do and it is a county-driven system. It is hard to engage 88 different processes, um, which is why we get stuck in the pilot phase, um, because we go to the counties that are willing to engage yeah. often, or we have an incentive, or they have an incentive, and then it doesn't go you know, kind of beyond that. But the other thing that I would um, emphasize is the personal regard piece. I mean, I don't know that there's a lot of literature on that, but I think that the, just the example you gave, Ryan, the person that kind of knew everybody um, and was seen by many people as a key champion or stakeholder and credible um, witness, if you will, to the process. And so a willingness to trust, I think that's important. The other thing is, I'll just say again, what you both said was that supervisory level. You know, we have found with the implementation of particularly MST or intensive home-based treatment, you know, even under the best of circumstances with great providers, great coaching, great training, great boosters, you know, our average length of stay for therapists is still two or three years, but much longer for supervisors. So engagement of those supervisors in the mission and the validity and the importance of the practice is where the corporate memory lives um, in our experience. Are you, are you rolling out MI as a pilot, or are you trying to get it out to everywhere at the same time? Well, for the, the main waiver program, we rolled it out in about half the counties over the last two years, and, and right now are kind of pushing the fidelity piece and performance management with a lot of carrot, and hopefully not too much stick, because the stick's mm -hmm. kind of coming next year. Mm -hmm. and, then, um, <laughs> and, and then for those who had the capacity currently and self-selected in, 
we're rolling out MI with about six counties this year, and, and we're doing it to a much higher level than has ever been done through the training system. So to fidelity as an evidence-based approach with a lot of individual coaching and monthly um, practice and, and taping and direct feedback. So for MI, it's self-selected, and we're gonna grow it from the grassroots. Um, but I think it's a neat way to bolster that practice to support the program at large. And are, are you using this, the, the pilot sites that have had uh, positive experiences to, yeah. to yeah. talk to the other? Mm -hmm. they need to yes, see yes. Testimonies. And yeah. yes, and we have one specific training day. It's five full training days um, over the course of three months. One specific day for supervisors and lead workers only and how they can support their teams yeah. locally. That's, and then that's, we have, that's we have probably the best strategy. Th I think yeah. that might be the winner yeah. too. Yeah, and then and then we have two um, counties that have already implemented independently in prior years and have really taken it to fidelity and made the investment on their own. So they're kind of our two champions, yeah. and we're supporting them and their new staff, and then having them talk to the, like, their peers. So, yeah, they believe in their peers. Yep. Yeah. Well, and it gets to the it gets to the the word that Patrick mentioned, which is trust. Right, so they're, they're gonna go to the people that they trust. And, and um, one, one, of the, one of the papers that I, that I flashed up there um, <laughs> is actually specifically, it tells the story of how we as a university over 20 years built a great trusting relationship with, with state government to do this work collaboratively. <coughs> and we hit on, and that paper hits on some of the issues that are relevant to you know, building trust huh. Uh, in what you're in what you're doing as well, and one of the, one of the things that we that we sort of uh, one of the epiphanies that we had is when you talk about collaboration, the the conventional wisdom is to think of it as a, a Venn diagram of overlapping circles, and everybody wants to focus on the pieces of the circles that overlap because that's what we have in common. Mm -hmm. The truth is, to build trust, you have to go in recognizing and paying attention to the bigger part of the circle that isn't your business. So for, for ex a practical example of that is go in and start the conversation by saying, who are you accountable to and what are you accountable for? And then figuring out a way that you can help them be more accountable, you know, prove themselves, <coughs> show their strengths to whoever they're accountable for based on whatever they're accountable to. And that might not actually, at first, have anything to do with MI. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But helping them to accomplish what are their <coughs> goals without first you know, <coughs> focusing on what's in it for you, yeah. that builds a long-lasting, long trusting relationship. So you meet them where they're at. Yeah. Yes. And then you move them forward. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Do we have any other questions in the back? Hi. My question is, one of the things we're trying to do it with our waiver implementation in Utah is to actually imp add to our system an, an implementation science model of implementing, if that makes sense. Trying to make that be embedded in the organization that any time we're doing implementation, we follow implementation science. And so one of the questions I would have is just what advice would you give generally in terms of trying to really embed this process into the organization without necessarily a focus on a specific evidence-based program that we're implementing. Is this at, is this at a provider <coughs> level organization or a state agency? A state agency, state, agency. state administered agency. So with, within our own organization. Well, I've been talking a lot, so I'll just shut up and let other people talk. <laughs> <coughs> It's like you're building the capacity of the people in the agency to continue to take in new innovation and do it themselves without you having to guide it. That's what you're doing with this. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we gravitated to GTO because they have, it came out of empowerment evaluation. These guys were evaluators first and it was about empowering folks to bring this process of looking at your practice and evaluating it and bring it to the field to do that themselves and building those skills and doing it. And so this model, the reason it's so simple and has the steps or the circles or whatever you wanna call it, is it can be taught to folks so that they can then take it, uptake it. So all those studies I mentioned that compared agencies with and without it, they taught them the, the model and then had them 
figure out how to kind of work, use the model to do their evidence-based practice, but then long after they were able to keep using that GTO model for new things. And so that was part of the outcome, is not just did they reach their outcomes, but did the, did the capacity stick? Mm -hmm. um, and so they've tested that out, and they may have better mechanisms for how to do it. I haven't read it all that carefully, but, but that's where we need to go. I've tended to use it as a person helping organizations do something, but really their idea of what it should be is to teach that to the organizations mm -hmm. themselves so they can keep doing it, so that it is sustainable. So mm -hmm. that model's there. Patrick, did you have a thought? No, I think, okay. no. I, I yeah, and, and, I mean, this may just be another way of saying that and reinforcing it, but I think what I've found is that it, uh, whether you're talking about at the state level or within a state agency, or you're talking about at the at the sort of provider level, I think um, I think it's really important, really helpful, to talk less about evidence-based <laughs> programs. That's the what, and talk about capacity building, mm -hmm. and that's the how. Yeah. Um, because uh, you know the reality is, I've never I've been working in, doing this work for 20 years. I've I've never encountered a single provider organization that's only doing evidence-based programs. So if you, if, you, uh, if you create this environment where evidence-based programs are something different and they're something more cumbersome because they have all these other hoops to jump through with fidelity and implementation quality and, and uh, you know, mapping logic models and all that, um, and the things that they're, the other things that they've been doing for a long time that they're probably quite happy with don't have all those strings attached, you've actually made, ev unintentionally made evidence-based programs less attractive. Um, so, but, but I think that uh, at a, uh, especially at a, at, a, at a state agency, state systems level, we have to really try to intentionally shift the culture from a culture of compliance to a culture of excellence. Oh, there and you go. and, and uh, you, you, those can't just be words, although they should be words. They should, that statement should be written into your organizational mission statement. That, that there should be something there that signifies that your agency is about building the capacity of the providers that you serve, that serve you, that serve the state. Um, and if that becomes the focus of your work, what you're going to do if you provide the support and the capacity to, to, to help provider organizations pursue excellence rather than compliance, what you're going to do is you're going to unleash the intrinsic motivation that the practitioners already have. That's why they got into this work. So they already have this intrinsic motivation to do what they're doing and do it really great. But a lot of times they just, they feel, they feel beat down by the by the sort of bureaucracy of compliance yeah. and whatnot. And I recognize that there, you know, we have issues of safety and things like that that, that are p of paramount importance, but we just have to make sure that we're, we're paying attention to building capacity of the providers and the practitioners that ultimately do the work. That's excellent. All right, well, unfortunately, our time is up. This has been a great conversation. We thank you for your attendance and participation and extend a thank you to our presenters. Thank you.